So a care plan is really a framework of what the residents' needs are. An advanced care directive is completely different. It's completed by somebody who has capacity, who has their wits about them, and has informed preferences about what they would like their goals of care to be. But say, you know, the person then develops, say, advanced dementia or a serious infection, they're not able to reason. The document really just helps me have a sense of what they prefer. And if they have a close family member, I would still have a conversation with them just to check, to say, look, as a doctor, seeing how things are going, this is what I think. You know, does that sound right for this person in, in front of us? And I think it's particularly useful because it encourages people to speak with their families because that's often the challenge. It's about giving the, the patient and the clients that control. So somebody that may not be able to verbalise, no, I don't want that, or yes, I do want that, or please do this. They can have that written down and recorded beforehand so that they can maintain that control right to the end of life. But it's only valid if someone cannot communicate. So even if someone has that document, I still have to talk to that person and ask them and get the opinion. So it's just there's a fallback plan. It's like a message in a bottle, really. In the situation where I cannot make my own decisions, this is what my wishes are. I think not everybody ultimately wants to make that decision. Not everybody wants to say outright, I want this to happen, I don't want this to happen. Some people are just play it by ear and, and whatever seems right at the time they'll go forward with. So they're apprehensive to do the advanced care directives. They don't necessarily want to put it in writing because they feel like it's going to lock them in. In that case, we still have the discussions. We still talk about what ultimately do they want. And it's not about just staying at home or going into hospital. It, it's about what level of support, what do you feel the family would be able to cope with. It can be about what my end of life picture looks like. It can be that I do not want to be admitted to hospital, I wouldn't want any respiratory devices used to keep me breathing, that I would not want intravenous antibiotics. You know, it can be as specific as that, or it can be just I'd like to be here at the facility, no more hospital, no more antibiotics, just all comfort measures that can be done. There have been a few residents who have, I suppose, expressed their anxiety about making a decision. You often find that maybe they're anxious about what, what do they want, but maybe they haven't talked it through with family and that's something they really wanted to do. They, they really want to have this conversation with family. Like I did have one client where the father didn't actually want to discuss his end of life. His cognition wasn't fantastic in the end. It was a really hard discussion with the son and he kind of put it off and put it off. And then I kind of said to him, listen, you know, if you want to keep us coming with our care towards the end, we do really need some guidance from you or from your father about what you want. So we discussed, did he want to be resuscitated, which then, you know, I could tell the carers, no, he didn't want to be resuscitated, so that if they were with him, we knew. We have community care client, husband and wife, that were living at home in the community. We've been providing support for both of them for probably 12 to 18 months. The wife did become palliative and her goal was to remain at home with her husband. So we were able to go in there, set up the advanced care directive, provide the comfort in the house for her to progress to that end stage of life in her own home. The care workers fed back to me that she wasn't herself ultimately. She was that little bit more teary and she was saying that she didn't want to stay at home. I think she could feel the stress from the family and then she'd communicated that to, to me and to other care workers and so she was still very mindful of her family even though she was you know towards the end of her life where previously she had adamantly said I want to stay at home I want to be here I want to pass away in my home with my family surrounding me, but I think she realised that it was too stressful for them. I went out to her face to face and had a discussion with her, as well as meeting with, with her husband and the family. From there, the decision was made with, with her consent and her ultimate goal in mind was to go up to hospital. So I made that decision and probably within 24 hours, we had her up in a, in a palliative care bed at the hospital. If a resident deteriorates and they've got an advanced care directive, we always still call the family and say, do you want them sent to hospital because your advanced care directive says, no, you don't want them sent. And that is the, the tricky thing about advanced care directives. A resident could put their wishes forward when they're cognitively intact and then the family can come along later on and revoke those wishes. So it, it does get tricky. It's very common and within families to have you know, a daughter wanting something, then a son wanting something else. And so there can be, yeah, real conflict. 
So I had a client and her name was Gail and some of the family lived far away and hadn't seen her for a long time. And the other family lived close to her and had been her main carers looking after her. So towards the end of life, when they came, their ideas on how her end of life directive should be clearly clashed and that caused stress because they would literally argue in front of her and so then she would get upset. It got to a point where it was quite stressful in the house. It was quite a highly strong environment. Care workers were going in assisting this client who was quite distressed about what was occurring and she would just get upset saying she didn't want to be there anymore and she would rather be in the hospital and not creating this environment for, for everybody in the house. There was one particular time and I did contact the call centre and Anna. It's afternoon tea. She stood and she shouldn't have stood. Then she couldn't sit down and the closest thing she could do was press the alert button. Her son was there and her son's friend were there. They were trying to calm her down and this alert button went through to another member of the family. So of course all the family come running in panic, screaming and yelling at Gail and of course that escalated her again. Gail's not happy, she's teary, she's crying, but you can't say to the family, back off or, or anything like that. If it had escalated real bad, I would have maybe said, oh, well, maybe you better go and give Gail a little bit of time. But I sat Gail down, calmed her down, asked what happened. She explained what happened. Five minutes later, the coffee was made, everybody was settled. I stayed longer to make sure Gail was okay, took her to the toilet and all that kind of stuff and sat her back down and she was fine when I left. Then I rang the call centre and then I let her know. I stayed longer. I couldn't leave her in that situation on her own, crying, upset. Yeah, no, that's a difficult one, that one. There's a range of different things there uh, that I suppose care staff should be mindful of when interacting with, with family members. I suppose that the key thing is maybe don't rush to judgement straight away take the time to ask that question or why are they coming from the place that they're coming from? Why are they acting in this way? I have to be really careful because I've got very, very strong views about um, quality of life. And I truly believe that if there is somebody who can't have quality of life, who can't talk, who can't feed themselves and they beg you, let me go, then it's their right to have that. Unfortunately, a lot of families don't want to let go because they feel guilty towards the end. And it's not my right to say, you need to get a care directive to say, do not resuscitate. Now that is stepping over the line. All it achieves is hostility between the family and the care worker. Because it's not about you and it's not about the family. It's about the client. You have to be really careful. There's a very fine line and you can't step over that line.